Hello and welcome to the Spyro presentation. I will have loads of exciting features to show you in this release, so I will just jump right into it. So for 18.5 we have introduced a new Pyro workflow to help you create all kind of sexy looking explosions and stuff. So for 19.0 we wanted to improve upon these um, workflow and improve to create uh, a better user experience for you. And the first part of the uh, of this uh, presentation will be about uh, the workflow updates mainly. So updates we made to the volume look in the viewport, updates to shelf tools, uh, and uh, update to the Pyro Solver interface and how does it helps you to create simulations faster or set up simulation faster and how does it fit into the overall Pyro uh, workflow. Then the second part of the presentation will be about individual tools such as shockwave muzzle flash tools. We have a really cool axis force which you can use for minimal solve or for sparse solve as well. We have uh, new volume tools to help you work with Pyro and one of the I think long awaited tools to mention here is the volume deformation tools which now come you know out of the box from with Houdini. Then uh, I will be talking about particle trails which is useful for uh, creating sparks. And the last entry in the list here is debris source which is um, how to create, like this This node is there to, to create the gap between RBD and Pyro and how does this fits, how this tool fits into the RBD Pyro workflow. To get this really going then, the first thing to mention is volumes in viewport and viewport updates. So ambient occlusion is a new pass for volumes in Houdini 19.0 and this was created by Omar to greatly improve the look of our volumes. So I just jump right into Houdini to demonstrate this. And what you see here is uh, just a, a, a default fireball from the shaft tool shaded as smoke. And uh, if you notice, so this is the, the default kind of hooding look we had uh, in 18.5. So it's pretty white everything and to actually get some details and to lit it, you would have to, you know, put down a light, enable a distant light here. And then you would get one side lit, but the other one is just completely unrealistically dark. And, you know, you can get away with it, like putting down more lights on the other side, uh, but it's just really time consuming. Um, and what uh, Omar did to, to really improve it is this ambient shadow scale. So if I just turn off this light and I just start to increase it, you will see how I just put on this ambient occlusion pass onto my volume and that helps you create to show all the nice details and cracks inside the volumes uh, uh, no matter of your uh, light. And the default is 0 0.5 so I just leave it like that and then now what you can do shading wise is that uh, I can indeed enable a, 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 a viewport light which again kind of snaps back to the 18.5 look but this is because what you actually need now is an environment light so as soon as I enable the environment light you will see that this environment light actually controls the, the ambient occlusion so as soon as you put in lights this um, this ambient occlusion also controlled by uh, uh, your environment light. So that means you can shade uh, different parts of your volume differently. Like the shadow parts, you can shade it with with some, let's say I shade it with some, some brownish color like this, and I can shade, you know, the distant light coming from more of a bluish color. So just kind of create some more interesting look. So this is something you could have not done in 18.5. And you see now that that my volume like you know it's lost it's completely you know dark side and uh, and it just looks you know pretty sweet from all angles 
The next very important one is the volume filtering, which is to help uh, the actual uh, slicey look. So in 18.5, when you look at the volume on the left, you can see all of these volume slices kind of just stacking up on each other, stack up on each other. But for 19.0, uh, we we have now the option to completely get rid of these uh, slices and smooth smooth these slices out, giving you uh, a much uh, better artifacts free looking volumes. So the next thing I would like to talk about is probably the most essential on how to create your pyro to look the same as what I've been presenting for 18.5 and for 19.0. And, uh, and this is something to do with uh, color management, which is nothing new uh, in Houdini 19.0 but uh, it's a feature that I think it's very essential to uh, to talk about and probably talk about in a bit more depth than I talked about for 18.5. So what is it about? Uh, and I will jump to Houdini now to demonstrate it. So, so if you install Houdini uh, out of the box, you run a fireball, you would end up with this look, uh, which I generally call the migraine look, because every time I see this kind of look, it just makes my head hurt. Um, simply because this is just displayed with the wrong colors. Um, so what's going on here? So to actually know that, uh, w w one way to check it in Houdini, and I want to show this because this is the thing which people usually don't know because we hid it so well. It's so well hidden that even my recording does not show this. Uh, but if I right click on this little eye icon here, which is uh, the icon for bringing up the display options, it brings up a menu actually, and I can enable color correction. And this brings up this, this button bar here, which is for you to manage colors in the viewport. So what, what does it, what it tells me is that uh, Houdini uh, renders these images uh, or the viewport in, uh, in, in a, 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 a scene linear color space. Um, but it applies a 2.2 gamma to it, and and this is this 2.2 gamma. This is the default how Houdini comes with, and and this is this gamma correction. It's uh, wrong. This gives you wrong colors, as you see here. Um, my my uh, brights are or the whites are too exposed. The yellows and oranges are kind of broken. And this is might not be so uh, visible when you just work with RBD or doing modeling, but when it comes to pyro, pyro kind of gets the short end of the stick or whatever you say that expression, because um, pyro you would expect that you get right colors immediately, the correct you know look in the viewport, but this is really not possible with Gamma 2.2. And no matter what you do in Gamma 2.2, no matter how much you change the colors, no matter how much you change exposures, you cannot just rape the colors um, to match the look what I've been presenting uh, uh, throughout this uh, presentation. Uh, what you need to do is you have to uh, set up your uh, a color pipeline. And one, the way to do it is set up ACES. And to do that, uh, um, I will show you where you can find the documentation for it. So if, if you open up Docs and I click on Pyro and Shading and Rendering section, then you will have the first thing here setting up ACES using Open Color IO. So unfortunately, this is a very manual setup where you have to download it from GitHub and it's a pretty large file. You have to install it, well, not install it, but download it and you have to set it up for Houdini. And as soon as you do that, uh, voila, magic, you, I can click on this uh, arrow here, Open Color IO, and immediately, automatically, I got the right colors. So basically, that means that I never ever had to touch these orange color 
throughout these two years to create a nice looking explosion. All the work for me was done just by setting up ACES and getting the right colors that uh, one would as expect. Uh, um, and um, unfortunately, so this is something that at the moment we do not have a good answer for you other than you have to do this manually. Um, and uh, there are other implications such as as soon as you use ACES, um, pyro is easy going because the colors coming from these color swatches and whatnot and not from textures but as soon as you you light and uh, uh, you know use textures and models your textures have to be converted to AC space so it's not so trivial and um, we really hope that we find uh, uh, a better uh, solution for it at some point than than having then rely on you guys doing it manually um, but uh, going back to my presentation uh, this is a really large topic and I think it's a really complicated topic as well uh, because every software does it differently and I just cannot find any um, reliable like uh, terming for like wording for these terms and uh, what I think maybe if you are more interested in it and you want to know uh, a bit more I would really recommend Chris uh, Brayon's uh, website where he talks about overall color management or uh, uh, overall ACES and how does it work into the VFX industry. Um, but also you can find many, many, you know, writings and, and YouTube videos about it and how to set it up. So please go and check it out. It's something that is very important. And uh, I just want to make sure that, you know, um, everybody knows that, uh, you know, that it's important that you get the right colors and how to get the right color set up uh, with Houdini. And if we are at uh, making things sexy, uh, I'm happy to say that we have updated our shelf tools as well. So our aim was for 19 uh, to create a different approach where our shelf tools are actually really good quality uh, uh, elements that can be used for, uh, you know, production as templates. Um, and um, uh, what you can see here is the fireball, we have a shockwave fireball um, and what we did not have so much in 18.5 are fire examples and uh, and uh, we improved the bonfire uh, shelf tool as well with sparks even so it will uh, create this nice uh, kind of fire look and we have a new uh, kind of muzzle flash uh, shelf tool example as well. So all of these were uh, like uh, the only thing changed after create clicking on the shaft tool is just the resolution change. So they were rendered with a lower uh, resolution, uh, sorry, a uh, higher resolution, lowering the voxel scale. So I would get more detail into it. But other than that, these are all karma renders uh, as you would get from the shaft tools. And then ju just to show some of this uh, in motion. So, and yeah, this is this is a new Bilovi smoke as well, which I have not mentioned it yet. The uh, bonfire in the viewport, bonfire as a karma render. And then uh, we got the fireball, which we already seen. This is a karma render again. This is a completely redone um, aerial explosion and uh, just a fireball with shockwave as well. Viewport and then uh, a karma render. And if we are at this shaft tools, then let's go on to how to actually simulate them. And for that, um, we redesigned the UI for uh, the Pyro Soap Solver, and this is something I really wanted to do for 18.5, but because of time constraints, we just did not really have the time and resources to do it. So, but I'm really glad that uh, 19 uh, has this. So, um, and this is meant to uh, make uh, 
you know, your life easier and provide a much better user experience when using Pyro. So to show this, um, I have Houdini here on the left side with the uh, uh, 18.5 interface and uh, the new interface on the right side. And uh, w w one of the things I, I was always um, uh, really um, picky about is how much uh, you got tabs inside tabs inside tabs and this is basically the reason the reason for this is because we pretty much promoted the DOP network into SOPs uh, but I wanted to take this a step further into organizing uh, uh, these uh, this layout into something that is more uh, uh, user friendly and more uh, logical into how you would set up a, a, a pyro server like this when when you start to you know create your pyro simulation and uh, and we also so for example what we have now is a left to right order so um so basically when you work uh you start in the setup tab you got the voxel size time scale so the most important things which you pretty much have to set once or, or you know very few times and then all the simulation settings here and what's really nice is that uh, instead of dealing with three checkboxes here inside this step structure we have now a single menu here which I don't think you see in the recording but we have sparse dance and minimal open CL options here to choose from and um, and then after you set it up, you move on to bound, which is, you know, setting up your bound, which is the next logical step to limit your uh, simulation area, regardless uh, whatever uh, solver you use, minimal, uh, sparse, or, well, dense, uh, both minimal and dense would require a bound anyway. Uh, then sourcing um, tab also got uh, a bit improvement here. One of the nice improvement is an actuation parameter, which you can just switch it on and off if you like. Uh, before you would have to actually set source scale to zero, which mean that your previous well, you, you would have to memorize what it was. Um, then the collision tab, and then we got the fields tab. So with the fields and shape tab actually, so these are very similar tabs and the aim here was that we create, uh, we, we kind of reorganize how our um, like shaping uh, parameters have been distributed in the solver. Uh, because we got temperature controls here in simulation, then we got shape controls, we got flame controls, color, etc. And what what we try to, to do is to divide into fields which will contain all uh, options for fields like density so dissipation goes here temperature which has temperature diffusion cooling rates etc also here you will emit temperature from flame then you got the flame settings color and speed and then the shape setting is responsible for controlling your velocity really so here we got buoyancy settings we got the wind which is kind of a, a new thing build into the pyro solver so it's kind of like advecting your um, entire velocity field by this wind uh, then uh, we got disturbance turbulence shredding these are all typical and flame expansion also moved here then the next thing is the look tab which is um, uh, pretty much the same. Only thing changes we change the default from being physical black body, moving away actually from physical black body, and uh, uh, choosing the the orange color RAM by default. And by the way, we also probably don't see it, but we also added now the orange color into the RAM preset. So no matter where you are in Houdini now, if you click the gear icon and change black to orange, you will get this uh, nice orange ramp. Um, then advanced tab, which just basically a storage place for all other options and the export tab, which is again, it moved to last because this is the last thing you would set up. And um, 
and yeah so pretty much pretty much that's uh, it what is nice to mention is uh, the what i did not mention is the limiting sourcing range so what what we tried to do is to create a more seamless um um behavior between minimal open cl and uh, and sparse so as you can see here i can uh, just simply click on sparse and immediately I'm getting uh, a, a simulation. So the switch between the two is seamless and sparse will of course limit you with the source range. So you can limit here, you can cycle your source range, but the nice thing is that you can also do the same thing in sparse mode. So if I enable this and so on, it will also uh, limit and uh, re and cycle my sourcing which is really great uh, and then the other thing is mention it's nice to mention is field guides and uh, uh, you can see here now i just enabled the, the flame guide here and i think i close this one because this is not that much relevant anymore so here you can see i'm displaying the the flame and what is nice thing is uh, is that the controls are very uh, sort of simplified really so you have the 3d guide you have the 2d guide you have one visualization with one ramp and and pretty much that's it and uh, this is compared to if you put down a dope network and if i put down a pyro uh, actually it has to be a smoke object um, and then i'm just running the display uh, you will see all of these visualizations are just loads of loads of parameters and uh, having them here simplified was actually one uh, thing which I think it was really important to do. And what is really cool is that is the compute range button. So at when you work with Pyro, I think it's very essential that you know your uh, field values and mostly what is your maximum field value for density, for temperature, uh, etc. And by saying compute range, you will get the maximum and well, minimum value is zero in this case, but get the maximum value on that frame. So you can then, uh, you know, get an idea what you should set for controlling the shapes uh, and the shape disturbance or any other kind of forces but again this compute range is not just here this is on everywhere where you have this kind of control range uh, kind of setup and uh, what is really nice as well and and this was kind of a long time thing that i really wanted is uh, uh, a disturbance guide so if i change to turbulence it was always we were getting all of these vectors showing up but with disturbance it was kind of hard to charge what size of disturbance i'm getting and now we have a disturbance visualizer which is actually listens to all of these uh, block size so now you can see that i actually can judge what my block size should be and what uh, you know what should be my uh, roughness etc etc but there is a lot more I would like to show you, so I just deleted everything and uh, I want to show you how you can get started with Pyro and again, how does it will relate to the Pyro solver. So, um, we have two shelf tools, we have a Pyro FX shelf and we have a simple FX shelf. So, what's the difference, why we have two and which one should you be using? And the simple answer is you should be using the simple FX. Um, and not the pyro effects. So the reason is so pyro effects, what it does, it puts down a DOP network. So the way you get the, the fireball is that uh, uh, it puts down the, the initial SOP setup in, in SOP level, and then it kind of, kind of puts your simulation into the DOP network. It's kind of this old school way of doing it. And you have all the controls here to do your simulation, etc. Uh, but this is something that is, I would say, not the encouraged way to do it. Uh, and hopefully this uh, 
this workflow will be actually removed later on. Uh, it is also a lot to maintain for us as well and and it's simply just not the way to get you going very easily. But instead we got the simple uh, effects shaft tool and if I click on the pyro solver then what it you will only get one single geometry and you will get the pyro solver sub which I've been just talking about. And the benefit of this is you will get all the nice cool features, as I said, you will get the nice easy visualization, etc., uh, which the, the DOP version does not provide. Um, and also the fact that this that minimal solver, for example, is set up for you right away. And we do not recommend to set up your minimal solve manually uh, just uh, in a DOPnet. So this is one extra reason. Also, one more reason to only use simple effects is because because of exactly this reason, we provide a lot more, uh, um, um, you know, minimal examples here, like torch fire, GPU explosion, which is just not available in the pyro effects. And also something like a muzzle flash setup, that is something that only exists in simple effects land, but not in DOPS. So this is something that, um, you know, uh worth to consider and i think this is a much more user friendly way to get going with pyro but now that you have you know all this pyro stuff going uh you know i can you know just start to simulate it i got a couple of frames going on so what is the next step so quick setup so we have quite a few quick setup which again unfortunately you will not see here so i will just say the names of what i clicked so I can click on, uh, for example, um, add color source. And then this will add uh, a source section here, automatically set it up how you would source in colors the right way. I just delete that now. Uh, we have options to create reference bands. And this will create a bonding box then, which is the size of, your simulation exactly on that frame and then you can it's automatically linked uh, to these centers and you just only have to say you know you want to limit your maximum size. Uh, we have options to set up SDF collisions so as soon as you do it it will set up a VDB from Polygon and all you need to do is just to plug in uh, 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 your geometry and then you will immediately have a collision and also uh, everything just on the collision step change right away the way you need your uh, parameters to set up when using VDB from polygons. Um, then, then the other thing you can do is uh, is actually uh, create uh, lights, for example. So uh, when you do that, it will bring up a window asking what kind of light setup do you want. And then uh, as you see, it's create an environment light and a distant light. Exactly the kind of setup I was trying to explain about occlusion uh, pass and how you set up a light thing there. So it will just drop you in like two default lights right away. Um, and then, uh, if you are to, let's say, export it, uh, uh, export this um, uh, simulation, we got, um, and oops, I accidentally clicked there, so just a second until it recooks. So we have a thing called optimize exports. So when I click that, it's automatically enables all the ticks, all the checkboxes you need to save out simulation. And this is very important because if you save out your cache without these enabled, and it's a heavy simulation, then you can end up 400 gigabytes of data. But as soon as I click on uh, optimize exports, suddenly that 400 gigabytes only ends up being um, 70 gigabytes, even less, 50, something like this. So uh, so it's like really uh, manages a lot with the, with the file sizes. And then as a last thing, if you want, you can then uh, use the quick setups uh, cache simulation 
and then right away it puts down um, a, a file cache node already automatically set up for you and ready to cache uh, basically and um, this is not it there is one more really nice feature i would like to show you which is uh, karma rendering so if you go on click setups uh create render stage and then you again select the, the default light setup you want you immediately got to drop into karma all you have to change is uh, uh, to change karma perspective and you immediately get a nice spiral render going so what this did to me it's just branched out uh, you know render fireball and then it created the lopnet uh, name based on the soap solver and then this imports in uh, all the uh, its imports in your volume it creates a render geometry setting needed for uh, rendering uh, so it enables velocity blur by default and we have a new feature volume velocity um, uh, a blur scale this will scale your volume velocity without actually touching your actual volume data so this is happening at render time it is very handy when you render fire like uh, effects so fire basically uh, usually a very nice trick is that to scale your volume velocity something like two and this will give you a much more kind of violent looking fire than you would get normally um, and the next thing is what it also enables is uh, the light source so volume light and then you can then play with the settings to make it even more uh, stronger and then it it what it does it puts down a material library the pyro shader inside the pyro bake volume is linked and then a distant light and the dome light and the camera uh, a camera which is positioned exactly the same way as your viewport was when you clicked this uh, on the quick setups and if um, if you happen to select the camera by default so if your viewport is actually looking through a camera what it will do it will just put down uh, an import sub to improve the camera instead of putting down a new camera therefore if you have an animation uh, it will you can immediately render your uh, explosion with uh, with uh, your already existing camera animation so all of these tools there to to basically the aim here is that with couple of clicks really a matter of two three clicks you can immediately already get something out either rendering either caching speeding up your workflow um, and therefore the conclusion is that's why this is the workload that we recommend to use rather than doing uh, again the dop kind of setups from the pyro effects um, and also uh, also what is worth to mention is that um, um, that now the uh, solver got three extra extra outputs so you have a bit more freedom to input your dop to output actually the dop nodes from this subnet and of course if you you know need more disturbance turbulence you can use you know the uh the the fx license and then you know put them more uh more dop nodes in there uh, even if you have to adjust and modify this pyro solver it's much better to open this one up uh, or create a new instance of this node and modify that than actually starting out from scratch from a dop network so there is really no uh, drawback or uh, you know there is only benefit by actually using this solver instead of you know manually building up your own let's jump to the new pyro tools then so in houdin 18.5 we introduced the pyro burst source node and uh, we now made an update to it to include more burst types and one of the new burst types is a muzzle flash and i will jump to houdin to demonstrate this so what you see here is just a pyro burst source node um, and if you actually put them one by default then you will see uh, it's set to explosion so it will create the default shape what you were already getting in 18.5 uh, 
but now we have a menu and you can select choose to do muzzle flash as well and then this will create this more um, elongated shape along the y-axis which you can use and um, I just put together here an example so if I play it it just kind of does its own thing so you would have to choreograph it the way you want to but what what you can do with this tool is you can create uh, perpendicular flashes what you see usually in for guns and so on so if I put down a circle I just make sure with an attribute just vector to point the the, the normals uh, uh, sideways so these are the ones that actually can control the direction of the uh, of the muzzle flashes the normal attribute so I just plug it in and make sure uh, to use the normal attribute for the direction and just scale down the size and I immediately get this animation and then if I merge now with my big uh, central muzzle flash then I get something like this and because of the like nature of this well it's called muzzle flash and that's what it uh, you know primarily meant to do but you can also use this for you know ground explosion something that's like uh, very uh, you know fast erupts from the ground and so on something you know uh, that you need a bit more boost uh, uh, than what you would get from a simple uh, you know the default explosion and the other big um, and really cool uh, burst type is the shockwave. And this is something we wanted for 18.5, but we did not have the capacity, so it became a 19.0 thing. And going to Houdini, uh, all I did is just change the burst type to shockwave, and I'm getting this uh, flat um, ground shockwave. But it does not have to be flat. Uh, you can create... Uh, uh, a hemisphere like this with it with even some thickness and you can also create just a slice and set it whichever side you want it to happen in your explosion and uh, that's not it actually we have another burst type which is blast rings so this is again at first looks like just a shockwave but when you play it it's actually creating a lot more of these uh, blast ring as the explosion would expand upward, upwards and to see fully how it's working i can use quick setup and set up blast wave with rings so what's happening here is that what you can see here is my blast rings and here the other one is the shock wave and I set it to this dome shape and you see here that the two are perfectly matching. So as soon as this condensed air reaches the top here and the blast ring is supposed to create a, a ring there, it just, you know, creates one and start to expand it, matching exactly the, the shape of the big dome. And this was actually used by Miguel Peresen and to put together this really cool example uh, for us. Uh, which is an atomic bomb explosion and you see he has been using the um, and I have to stop it he has been using uh, actually multiple of the uh, of these bur burst sources so one is to create one shockwave to create the flat uh, ground one shockwave is to well create the this uh, really dense kind of pyro cloud effects then um, couple of uh, pyro burst sources for the actual uh, explosion shapes and then we got the blast rings advancing exactly like I was showing it in uh, Houdini so and to look at the final uh, animation it's looking like this and just play it one more time And just to show you one more demo, I just jump back to the slide to show you the um, uh, the YouTube link for the reference we use. And I can also jump to YouTube.
We really loved it and we wanted to replicate it. So um, to do that, um, I show you one of the uh, test elements we did uh, where I put in the same video in the background and I just overlaid uh, a couple of in development pyro uh, kind of elements here. And this is just using the simple pyro burst elements and just get the timing and the overall motion right. Is actually showing all the elements, and uh, this one is actually using the the ground, uh, the shockwave elements, uh, the, the shockwave burst type to create this kind of advancing uh, uh, ground component. And then this is just another kind of rendering of this element with the different uh, lightning and uh, coloring. And this is really nice. So this is showing the uh, entire video from uh, uh, from above, actually. Uh, so and this is actually important because this is actually rendered from the X with XPU from from Karma XP. So this is very fast. So this was super fast to render, uh, literally a um, couple of seconds. And these are very heavy volumes uh, to get going on and. Um, and yeah, this is just really nice that we get the absorption color also working in the XP shader. So you can really get this, this super nice kind of color scattering inside the volume. And as, as you can guess, the camera was kind of set it up somewhere from here looking at it. And you can see it's loads of cheating, loads of like animating the, the, the actual each components to kind of make it look good from the camera and give you that really like this blast kind of impact which you get initially from the from the video one of the new dop nodes is the gas velocity scaled up so this is uh useful for um you know changing the motion of your fluid simulation so uh, it, it serves two purposes one purpose you can use it to kind of dampen your uh, your motion so if the explosion initially moves super fast you can slow it down uh, but also what you can do is you can uh, and I show you a video clip for that uh, you can also kind of use uh, another fill like in this case I use just the flame field to kind of inject velocity into the simulation and what you see is on the left, it's uh, the simulation without uh, the gas velocity scaled up. And on the right, um, you see the, um, the gas velocity scale applied only at certain areas. And, uh, and you can see how the motion is just more eruptive. And then you can also control to cool it down. For example, here I'm cooling it down on areas where there is no, uh, where the flame kind of cooled down to a certain uh, value and the second really cool dop node is the axis force dop so this lets you uh, you know create a, a orbital or suction force uh, or move the fluid along the axis so this is this is something that is a, a really cool tool and i want to show you it in in houdini so this is the scene file those kind of portal effects were made with so I only have, uh, you know, like a kind of ring of volumes here for sourcing. And you see that the pyro solver is in minimal solve. And if I play it, uh, I just get this really cool kind of portal looking effect. And uh, if I just dive inside it, you see that there is this gas axis force stop, which actually doing all the magic behind. So this is the suction force. You can have an axis force along the axis. And, and this tube represents, uh, you know, the, um, the area where, where this uh, axis force actually having effect on the volume. Uh, and then an orbit force, which makes um, the, the volume swirl around the axis. And you can also have some strength mass, so you can, you can control the strength of the axis force based on your own custom uh, volumes. So this is pretty cool. So it looks like this. Um, and uh, if I just, uh, uh, I can go and, uh, and just... Uh, play it with the pyro bake volume then I can get all this really cool uh, kind of coloring 
uh, in the viewport going on. So, so yeah. <clears throat> but of course, this is with the pyrobake volume. This is rather slower because I'm I'm using the calculating the scatter volume to create this uh, more magical kind of uh, look for the portal. Uh, for the portal effects and if I just play uh, the different variation we created so this is the same simulation as you uh, as you've seen in the viewport and it just rendered with a uh, different coloring and this is uh, done in the viewport the render so this is just uh, literally some free books but you can see how you can get some nice uh, also magical kind of coloring just by doing a nice little blur with the with the scatter volume so this is just one more case to use the pyrobake volume scatter section not just for explosion but creating some nice kind of magical glowy effect jumping back to the soap tools we have a new cool set of volume deformation tools so let me show you it in Houdini. So we have a fireball here and I just want to deform it. So what I'm doing is I use a lattice from volume sub which uh, based on the input volume it generates uh, uh, a set of grid points which then I can use to deform any way I want to with any tool I want to. And uh, using a volume deform sub which first which is first input the actual volume i want to deform and the second is uh, uh, the actual deform lattice points i can create all this kind of cool effects to deform my fireball and this is just a nice contact sheet showing the uh, render of the fireball on the left side showing left top side left bottom side is the deformed volume with the lattice and the right side is uh, a Karma CPU and a Karma XPU render of the deformed fireball. And lastly, I want to show you one more example uh, we did as an interproject with Joshua Rizzo. So this is a fire tornado. And what we did is we ran a particle simulation just kind of swirling upwards using that as a source for fire. But then we used the axis force to help the fluid motion to swirl even more. Uh, and then at the end, uh, after we got this, uh, this nice straight motion, we run it through our volume deformation tools. So, and this is to give this kind of interesting looking uh, bending that you would get when a, a tornado kind of moving around. And then this is uh, a Karma CPU render, just, uh, you know, shading it with a bit, of, bit more uh, smoke on the outer edges. And then I also have a Karma render, which is on the XPU. And again, this is super fast. And then this is here with just more fire, kind of less smoke, kind of shading. And I have a contact sheet as well, which shows all of these elements together. Uh, so the undeformed volume, the deformed volume with the lattice and the uh, final two renders. And then coming to the trail and the attribute adjust color. So again, let me switch to Houdini to demonstrate. So if I put down a grid and uh, using an attribute adjust color node, um, this has pretty much the same interface, but we extended the functionalities for the attribute adjust node. So this is not um, this is not only for uh, the color node, but attribute adjust flow, etc we have added new options like uh, uh, lines so you can have a start and an end point you can draw it in the viewport and then and then you can create colors or attribute values based on the line you can create it based on a radial shape or uh, the other one is based on the bonding box of the geometry so these are all new features again for all attribute adjust nodes and uh, what is also really nice is the um, actually the enable color correction section so here we have a set of notes to do like very basic uh, color correction uh, um, that you can apply to the uh, color 
And then I actually let me just delete this and then I right away show the sparks. And the best way is if I do a pyro scatter from burst node here. And and the reason why I'm doing it, well, one thing is because it's giving me points with velocities that I can use. And the other one, it has some nice quick setup features. So I just increase the number of points. I set, I offset the frames actually by 12. So they start from going to be all randomized. And with the quick setup, which again, you cannot see, I select simulated sparks. And um, as soon as it generated, it gives me this uh, network automatically. And when I display the pop simulation, you just see these uh, particles. So when someone working with uh, like spark effects and so on, there are kind of two main approaches. One is that you can take this particle simulation, let's say, and render it from the camera with motion blur. And uh, you get these particles to streak out and there you go, you got kind of the sparks. Um, but uh, the kind of drawback of that method is that uh, you have no control over the color, for example, across the length of the spark. Uh, it's just a simple, you know, you have only one point with one color information. There is nothing uh, that you can control the color of the motion blur along the length. And if you look at references, uh, many sparks in close-up, you can see that it's actually has very distinctive differences, uh, uh, not just like color across the length, but let's say size, etc., etc. And the other uh, approaches, which is what we created tools for, is uh, to actually generate these uh, uh, sparks uh, in Houdini already, uh, ready for rendering. So this this already now represents your motion blur sparks. So at render time, you do not need to enable motion blur, blur for this. But that's, of course, also mean that you must have to render the spark element separately from the rest of your scene, for example, where you actually want to have motion blur on. So it has, you know, also um, cons and pros, but generally this is a much more artistic friendly approach to generate uh, sparks. And then if I play it, you know, I'm just getting these nice spark trails. And, um, and, it, and, and you have many kind of um, options here to, to randomize color, etc. Uh, actually, one of the nice things is here, like I've been, I was kind of developing the kind of look and trying to create like demo materials. I was kind of trying with all different kind of color combination ramps and so on and and a set of color palettes and in the end nothing in the viewport everything seemed fine but in the render not so much and uh, somehow automatically I was like hmm, why not just drop in the the pyro orange ramp into this and uh, Actually, suddenly I got something that uh, immediately I liked uh, for the viewport and for also worked really nicely in the render. So it's kind of like a magic ramp that you can pretty much just drop into everywhere and solve your problem. So yeah, I just kept using it for all of our demo materials for the sparks. And one other thing which is really nice is the splitting feature. So this is able to split your sparks as you can see here, uh, without actually doing any kind of additional like secondary particle simulation. So, and this is this is super nice because this even can um, can uh, create these splits over multiple frame. So. Um, uh, this is not magic, it just gathers kind of history of the particles and figures figures out when to hold the actual parent particle and then based on that it's able to create uh, split its particles for multiple frames. And to show you it in practice, this is the, the splash screen intro video. So this was done using exactly this tool so um just as the the sparkler the the flame advances then i'm just running a couple of particle simulations and combining all of them 
uh, with this trail, uh, particle trail, so to create this kind of sparks uh, look. And again, this is using the orange color ramp. And what is actually really, really fun thing to do was that uh, I just took the particle simulation from the um, from the bonfire shelf tool, and I literally just uh, Rotated the particles the shaft tool gave me, rotated it sideways, put it in the background, and and that gave me this kind of interesting background uh, particle floating effects. And then if we are at the pyro schedule from Burst node, uh, there is a new entry as well, which is simulated debris. And this will connect us a tiny bit into our last uh, section, but not that quickly yet. Uh, but um, uh, so this setup, it's what it's doing. It's uh, again preparing my points for simulation. But what I do here is I'm, I am creating... Uh, uh, debris pieces uh, and this is simply just doing a box and a material fracture and uh, and preparing them as uh, RBD pieces for uh, pebbles and then um, yeah just getting copied on all of these points and it just runs to an RBD bullet solver and what you see here is just these points are, uh, or these rigid bodies just being, uh, you know, blown out by uh, uh, by the explosion. So, um, and again, I can go in here and just say offset per point, and then and then I can get something like like this immediately set up. So this is this is just very simple for demonstration and getting you going. Uh, obviously, this is a very simple geometry, and uh, um, you know there could be ideas where we can develop this uh, kind of workflow further and like providing debris pieces. But uh, uh, at the moment, I think this is uh, uh, this is a good start to get going with something like this and. Uh, um, this actually connects us to the last uh, entry, which is uh, debris sourcing. Debris source is something that was already coming with Houdini, but it was very old, not been touched for a while, and especially was not updated to handle uh, peg geometries or any of the or work with any of the new pyro tools. And I kind of thought that it was time to actually. Um, give it a, a new um, uh, iteration and, and update this tool. So um, to what it does, let me just jump back here and uh, I show you it in a simple example. So I have a box here. Uh, I have a, just a fractured box. I configure it uh, and uh, using an RBD bullet solver with a grid, I'm just getting this simulation. So pretty standard, uh, nothing complex here. And then I can plug in the next thing is the debris source. So um, I can just, uh, you know, as soon as I play it, what you can see is here I have uh, scattered points on the surface of my geometry. And, um, and uh, I just say uh, use all the interior points. And I also disable here, uh, remove unrelease, remove life end. So what you're going to see here now is these points are actually only birthed when the rigid body pieces are actually uh, separated and falling apart. And then you can set how long this, those points which are broken apart should live. Uh, and, and the color kind of indicates the life. Uh, so as soon as you know they reach the the the, the black stuff, they kind of die off uh, for the dark color. I mean, uh, and you can set set the, the how long they live also in matter of frames. So you can see now uh, uh, that this is a bit more realistic. Um, well, depending on what you do. So so this debris source node is. Uh, 
it's good for many things so this is the base for for really many things so you can use it you can use these points as i said when you only have one you birthing it on one or two frames you can use it to birth the secondary rigid bodies uh, you can use it to birth like secondary uh, particle simulation for your destruction but also um, if I go back and change it so that these uh, points live much longer, then this is very good to search actually pyro out of this. So, you know, whenever something breaks and so on, it sort of emits uh, a certain amount of dust from it. So this is the go-to tool to create the pyro sources uh, for your destruction. And you can create, uh, you know, many attributes. You can create uh, um, the distance attribute, which uh, tells how far uh, uh, the space points are separated. You can create, you know, the depth attribute, how much that point is inside the geometry. You can create density attribute for pyro and etc. and etc. And you have some post process to 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 you know. Um, clamp it by speed threshold or volume threshold let's say uh, you don't want to emit from the little glass shaders in the building so you can just you know uh, create some culling there and uh, the, you can see that it has two inputs uh, and um, the reason for that is because what I just set up now with the simple example this is like you know all okay um this works fine but as soon as you have a massive destruction simulation and you would try to plug in uh uh your rbds uh it will just uh you know be very slow and painful and uh, and for that the workflow is that you actually um uh, you can you should be connecting the rest geometry in the first input and then the simulated points should be the second input so basically you only scatter uh, points this needed points has to be scattered only once and using the simulated points it can do its own x uh, form transform to kind of move these points accordingly and you see the result is the same uh, but uh, but here now you can really crank up the uh, uh, the number of RBDs and this debris uh, source node will uh, still work and and give you all the all the points you need. And to show you a practical example of that, I have our last demo for this presentation, uh, which is this ground explosion. And as you can see, this uh, secondary uh, debris source points are showing up where. Uh, the pieces are actually falling apart and then these points then can be used to emit smoke and all other sort of things as i explained uh and then this is this in this one for example i'm sourcing a secondary rigid uh like uh, like little pebbles for a secondary rbd simulation so the the main rbd simulation which which is the one simulated the big uh, ground chunks this is now a collision geometry and i just instance little pebbles geometry on those uh, points i generated with this node and just run that rbd simulation and uh, and this is the the result so you can give a lot more interesting detail and this is the final uh, so there is a lot more going on here uh, it has uh, explosion as well it has uh, all kind of PBD stop, so there is a PBD grass here simulated, there is some PBD sand, and the sand also kind of, it's less visible, but it's also simulated uh, or uh, sourced from the debris source node. So then, uh, at the end of the presentation so thank you so much for listening and hopefully you guys will all enjoy all of these new tools and features for houdini 19.